we are here because of an amazing fact. Our ability to relieve the suffering and improve the quality of life of people with serious illness has never been more powerful in the history of human medicine than it is right now. Our main challenge, our driving mission, is to assure that this powerful approach is available to all who need it, whenever they need it, where you work, in your community, and around the world. First, I want to briefly review how we got to this place. As part of that review, I want to clarify a bit of language that frequently complicates discussion of this field between individuals, between parts of the healthcare system, and especially between countries. I also want to illustrate the mental models we use for providing this care to individuals. Second, I want to reflect on who provides palliative care. Lastly, I want to expand on what I think this means for you. How did we get here? We can point to acts of kindness and compassion towards very ill patients throughout the 5,000 years of recorded history of medicine. Yet, the origins of what we now call palliative care began in London after World War II in the 1940s. Cicely Saunders was raised in a devoutly religious family who valued what you do in the world as a product of faith. She became a nurse, but hurt her back and had to stop. She became a medical social worker and began seeing cancer patients in a surgical ward at St. Thomas's Hospital in London. She saw patients dying of cancer alone without pain relief or family support or much medical attention and wanted to do something about it. At the advice of the surgeon leading the ward where she worked, she went to medical school and became a physician. During those years, she volunteered at night in hospices, places where patients were sent to die. In one of those hospices, she observed the regular giving of oral morphine with better pain control than she had ever seen in the hospital. But that was only part of the innovation. From her direct observations of patients and their families, she formulated a theory she called total pain. This model is central to our field. Patients suffer in four dimensions. First, physical, like pain and nausea and shortness of breath. Second, emotional, like anxiety, sadness, or anger. Third, practical, their role in their family network, their ability to have enough money to pay their bills, access to food, medicine, and people who can provide help. And fourth, spiritual, their sense of meaning and purpose that is larger than themselves. She imagined an organized approach to relieving suffering and improving quality of life in those four dimensions. She saw the need for a team approach that includes physicians, nurses, social workers and chaplains as the four core disciplines with expertise in those four dimensions of suffering. Other disciplines, like psychology, physical, occupational, and speech therapy, pharmacy, and the like are added as needed to augment those four core disciplines. Some have observed that Dr. Saunders herself had all the training of the four core disciplines for those four dimensions, a unique confluence of the right background, the right opportunity, and the gumption to do something about it. In other words, she had leadership skills. She tried to implement that vision at St. Thomas's Hospital and failed. She tried to implement it in the three existing hospices serving metropolitan London and failed. So she raised the money and built her own institution, 
St. Christopher's Hospice in South Suburban London. Remember that the next time you are frustrated at work. She built and staffed a new 52-bed freestanding inpatient facility to prove a point. It wasn't the first hospice, it was the first academic hospice, a specialist institution that combined clinical care, education, and research on a special population. It wasn't fancy, it wasn't pretty, yet it changed healthcare around the world. The role of specialty units deserves some emphasis. Specialty units, like St. Christopher's, aren't places where something is available that can't be given anywhere else. They are a place where willing and interested healthcare professionals are brought together in one place and develop expertise because they do the same thing over and over. It's not different than the rationale for hospitals or maternity wards or intensive care units or burn units. Those places make the care more efficient, and because of the concentration, they are great places to learn. That's why, if you want to learn more in order to make that part of your practice, you go to study there and take the information home. Kobacker House, our unit here at Ohio Health, an integrated healthcare system of 12 hospitals serving the central part of the state of Ohio in the Midwest region of the United States is like this. But what is done there can be done anywhere. In teaching physicians and other health professionals for the past 25 years, I am sustained by the stories they tell me about what they do with what they learn. All of them tell me it changes their practice, not just their care of the dying. Most striking to me are the stories told by the Navy family medicine residents who said they took what they learned in the hospice unit and applied it to the patients they cared for on the maternity ward and emergency departments seeing trauma cases when they were back on the Marine base the next month. They were smart enough to know that this approach to caring for people isn't just effective for the dying, it has broad application in medicine. I am frequently credited for helping drive the official recognition of the specialty of palliative medicine and the development of training programs in the United States. Let me tell you the core of how that happened. I did my residency in internal medicine in a community teaching hospital that had a hospice unit. In my first year, I was admitting patients all over that 750-bed hospital, including the eight-bed hospice unit. I was struck by two things. First, the patients were getting better care for their particular situation. And second, the patients themselves weren't different from those I was admitting elsewhere. I became very curious about this and wanted to make the insights and techniques of the hospice unit available to all the patients who needed it, everywhere in the hospital, not just in that eight-bed unit. That was very much what Dr. Balfour Mount, a urological surgeon in Montreal, Canada, did. He visited St. Christopher's and wondered if he had a unit inside the principal teaching hospital of McGill University's medical school and a consult service that could see anyone in the hospital if he could bring this new approach to Canadian medicine. But there was a problem. McGill is in the French-speaking part of Canada. In France, since the time of the Crusades, a hospice was a name used for places to send the sick poor. He couldn't use the word hospice without the French Canadians being turned off by the connotation. So, when he was shaving one morning, he thought he'd call it palliative care, soin palliatif, 
in French, cuidados paliativos in Spanish. This brings up the issue of language. It reminds me of some of the debates I see reported about the various world religions where language is the source of schism and dissension. The word hospice is used in at least four ways that I can see. First, a place with beds where people go to die. Second, a program of interdisciplinary care for the dying that cares for them where they live. Third, an approach to care that anyone can apply in their practice. And fourth, in the U.S., a very specific set of rules and regulations that accompany a federal government program to pay for the care for those eligible. The term palliative care was coined to separate that body of knowledge and practice from the connotations that others had to the word hospice. It freed that body of knowledge to be applied more broadly. All hospice care is palliative care, but not all palliative care is hospice care. It is so distressing to hear colleagues say, oh, I don't do hospice care, I do palliative care. It's much different. We may need to make those distinctions in our marketing, or our business planning, or our branding. But let's be clear that these are nuances in language, not in fundamental principles. There is one body of knowledge and practice that can be applied to a variety of patients under a variety of program names. But this brings me to a second problem we encounter, the way people think. Many are dualistic, concrete thinkers. Care is either curative or palliative. You choose hospice care. It's not for everyone. You are cared for either by palliative or hospice care, not both. You must cross a barrier or threshold. It drives me crazy when I hear someone say, is he a hospice patient? Is she palliative yet? He's not appropriate or ready for hospice care. Dr. Nicholas Christakis at Harvard calls this the over-the-wall model. You pitch the patient over the wall from curative land to comfort land. At least for us in the profession, we must be committed to the concepts separate from the programs and institutions that make them practically available. Why would you discover an amazingly effective body of knowledge and practice and save it up and only use it for the dying? We didn't do that with penicillin. It was discovered and first used only in those dying of community-acquired pneumonia. It would never have been used for the host of other infections for which it and its descendants are now used if we'd kept it associated only with those dying of pneumonia. Now we use it intravenously in the hospital and orally as pills at home. Can it be given intravenously at home? Yes. Can it be given orally in the hospital? Yes. Can it be used to prevent infections? Yes. Do people have to believe in penicillin? No. People can accept or reject standard medical advice, but we push hard because antibiotics have been proven to be better than no antibiotics for bacterial infections. The same is true for chemotherapy. Nitrogen mustard was used in World War I to kill people. It also shrinks lymph nodes. We tried it on people dying of lymphoma. Some of them live longer or were cured. We then used it to cure testicular cancer, something from which everyone died. All of chemotherapy is conceptually a descendant of mustard gas. What if we'd said, oh no, that is only for killing people? Or, 
chemotherapy can only be given intravenously for people dying of lymphoma. Surely we can have the good sense to apply this conceptual thinking to palliative care. This brings me to the second major point I want to address. Who does palliative care? Whose job is it to relieve the suffering and improve the quality of life of patients and their families? Dr. Saunders didn't set out to create a new place and a new approach to care and wall it off from the rest of healthcare. She founded St. Christopher's Hospice as a place to demonstrate, explore, teach, and disseminate. Pain control, symptom control, communication skills, whole person care by an interdisciplinary team with a balanced approach to physical, emotional, practical, and spiritual dimensions can be applied throughout healthcare. The knowledge and skills can be applied by any single individual as part of his or her practice. I would call this primary palliative care, what everyone can do. And in healthcare systems that apply standards, it is increasingly seen as a standard of care, like washing your hands before you operate. Everyone needs to wash their hands, not just the surgeons. Everyone needs to play their role to control pain, anxiety, improve the practical dimensions of people's lives, and attend to the spiritual pain of serious illness. So what about those specialist teams in our hospitals, or in our outpatient offices, or making home visits? What about the organized hospice programs with inpatient units and home care teams? I would call them secondary or specialist palliative care. They are the teams for the difficult cases, to staff the specialty units, or to provide an approach to care to a defined population of patients for purposes of efficiency and division of labor. This specialist approach to patients in the last months of life has been proven to be superior to care that doesn't include it. The science is clear. We need to move past a model of choice to a model of ensuring access to best practice. In the hospitals in central Ohio where I work, and in many that I visit, I see a growing pattern of calling the specialist palliative care team to give the bad news or to prescribe the opioids. If a patient doesn't choose hospice, there's no sense of responsibility that the patient has rejected best medical advice and will get an inferior approach to their care. In other words, it's not my job. I worry this represents an unintended de-skilling of the rest of the workforce. Would we have a system where only infectious disease physicians can prescribe antibiotics? Well, we do in some settings that are very well resourced, like specialty cancer hospitals or infectious disease hospitals. But in most places, everybody is expected to be able to diagnose an infection and prescribe the appropriate antibiotic. At a minimum, we expect to notice that a fever isn't normal and to get help if we don't know what to do. We call an infectious disease expert if what we do doesn't work. The same is true for heart failure. Why do we have cardiologists? They provide consultation for the cases where the diagnosis is difficult or our initial treatment is no longer working. It is true that in some wealthy settings, everyone with heart failure goes to a cardiologist for their routine heart failure care as part of team care and efficient division of labor. And what about specialty units or programs that most of the world calls hospice? Should patients have to suffer and wait to get into such a unit or program 
in order to get attention to their suffering? Surely not. I continue to be so angry and frustrated that patients with uncontrolled pain, sometimes for many months, get into a hospice, including Kobacher House, and have their pain controlled within hours using approaches that anyone could do anywhere. I fear that one of the unintended consequences of hospice programs and freestanding places like Kobacher House is the implication that is where you get the comfort care, nowhere else. That those doses of morphine can only be given there. This is just absurd, dualistic thinking that prevents good care. Which brings me to the third point I want to make. What all of this means for you. As part of a profession, we take an oath to make what we know available to those who need it and to advocate that patients receive the best care possible. That is the social contract we make in exchange for our licenses to practice. Since hospice and palliative care has now been scientifically proven to be the best approach to the care of the dying, and to improve the care of others when it is combined with standard care, then the era of choice needs to be behind us. There was a time at the beginning of the 20th century when washing your hands before you did an operation was a choice. There was an embarrassingly long period of at least 80 years where choice about hand washing before surgical operations led to unnecessary death, disability, and suffering because of the laggards to adopt the change. Now you lose your license and your job if you don't wash your hands before operating. The same needs to be true for the relief of pain and suffering. At the beginning of the 21st century, Palliative care knowledge and skills should be an expected part of our routine practice, and we should be advocates for the standard that assures its availability to everyone who needs it, and censures those who refuse to adopt the new skills. We must resist the multiple messages, mostly emanating from business ethics rather than professional ethics, that medicine is just a set of procedures or a list of lab values referring only to an organ or a disease. In this model, healthcare is no different than shopping for shoes. It drives me crazy when I hear a medical student or resident say, oh, it's so interesting seeing non-medical things like good communication skills. No. We in medicine care for human beings, each of whom has a physical, emotional, practical, and spiritual dimension to their illness experience. Human beings live as part of groups and social networks, their families, whether they are biological or chosen. All sick people suffer. It is part of the progress of medicine that palliative care become as important and uncontroversial as hand washing, clean water, vaccination, and antibiotics. Each of us, as healthcare professionals, needs to claim this field as an integrated part of standard healthcare. Not a choice, not an optional extra, not a caboose at the end of the train that might or might not be there. What you will discover as I discovered as I started in this career, is the great personal reward of this practice, of making the knowledge and skills your own. There is no greater professional reward than when a patient and his or her family says thank you, when they had no idea things could be turned for the better. The more difficult the patient and family constellation, the greater the reward. I get great professional satisfaction now, as a specialist, when I can work as part of a team, 
to relieve intractable pain or nausea, find hope for a future that previously looked hopeless, facilitate forgiveness in a wounded family, or help a colleague feel like a success when she previously thought she was a failure. Now, I work primarily administratively because I want to make this a routine part of the care of a large integrated healthcare system serving Central Ohio, as routine as maternity care. The drive to make bad things better brings us into medicine. When you do that, it brings joy and deep satisfaction at the end of the day. It shouldn't be a mere choice, it's worth fighting for. That's what keeps me in the work. I want you to find that joy too.